Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied unto you today. Welcome in Jesus' name to our service. We're glad that you're here together with us. If you have a bulletin, I'd like to call your attention to a couple of things. First of all, today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Um, We've said this numerous times, but I'll say it again, that really the requirements to be a part of the Lord's Supper are that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and are able to examine yourself. And so if you're able to do those things, we invite you to be a part of that. It will be uh, given out, distri distributed after the message this morning. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that we have a Bible study here uh, in the library. Uh, uh, it's on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock. We are studying the book of 1 Corinthians. We have a good group of people that come, and uh, there's always room for one more. So you are invited to join us if that fits your schedule. Uh, we have a good time of studying the scriptures together. I also want to say that um, there are some people that would like to see the service again. And that is, we are blessed because Larry and Angie come over here every week, and Larry is videotaping. You can see it as we see today. And if you would like to access that service again, there are two ways you can do it. You can give me your, uh, your email address, and uh, roughly about 6 o'clock or so on Sunday, after, Sunday evening, I send out an email with the link for the actual YouTube video there. Or if you wanted to do an easier way, you can simply look up Larry Hagerman's name on YouTube and you'll see a whole uh, menu of services from today uh, all the way back for about two or three years. So, uh, Larry, what about three o'clock or four o'clock? Usually that's when it's online? It's about four o'clock. Yeah, Larry, Larry has to go home and he has to edit it and then publish it to YouTube and then it's there. So, so you're welcome to do that if you'd like. Just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your faithfulness in giving. We appreciate the faithfulness of God's people. Thank you for giving each Sunday. Are there any other announcements, Donna? Did you want to give a, a report about last Sunday and the women's outing? Yes, I would love to. Um, did you get thrown out of the place? No. <laughs> no, we did not. We were Maybe well behaved. We were well behaved. Um, we went to oh. Perkins. By the time I got there, I had to go home and check on Bob, make sure he was okay. Uh, but by the time I got there, uh, everyone was seated. We had a real nice table. And I believe there was 12 of us, like the apostles. <laughs> <laughs> um, we all ate very well. We enjoyed our meal. The waitress was absolutely awesome. She took care of us, so we, of course, gave her a nice tip for her all our work. And uh, we had a nice time. And we need to do it more often than once a year. And I think that it should be the men and women, we should all get together, and we should do it more than once a year. So we're going to work on that. Okay? That's it. <laughs> uh, someone asked a young child, what are the epistles? And the boy said, are they the wives of the apostles? <laughs> So you guys must have been the epistles there last, last Sunday, right? So. All right. What's that? It was very nice. Thank you. Yes. Praise God. All right. So let's turn our hearts to the Lord. I, I do want to call your attention to the bulletin uh, on the uh, prayer requests. I have several uh, asterisks by names of people that haven't been on our list before or maybe should have been there before and were added. And uh, so we're going to especially pray for them today, but we also remember the ones we've had on there for some time. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord, and if you have uh, your bulletins, uh, read with me as I read aloud the opening scripture taken from Psalm 113, where it says this, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we're thankful today for the privilege of prayer. We're thankful for the opportunity to come into your presence and speak with the Almighty God. And we know that that's been given to us, this privilege, because of the new and living way that Jesus provided for us through his death on the cross and his resurrection. And so we celebrate that again today, Lord, and we come before you and seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. 
Lord, we, we desire in our hearts to honor you with our lives. We're thankful, Lord, for each person that has come, and I pray, Lord, that you would meet their needs today. I pray that as they come, that they would enter into this worship and that you, by your Spirit, would come and speak to us in this time. May this uh, truly be an encounter with the Almighty, and may we truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless this time together now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing three songs together. The first one is number 70. Number 70. I think many of you may know this song pretty well. The song is entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. Number 70. Let's stand together and sing the verses of this song. Good singing. Greet one another with the peace of Christ in these days. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, uh, 297 in the hymnal is the song Cleanse Me. I'm not sure if we know it that well. Emma, would you play through it once? But this is an appropriate song for considering we're coming to the Lord's table today because the psalmist really asks the question, asking God to search his heart. So would you just play through it once? together. Before today, how many of you had never sung that song before? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Well, you did a good job the first time for singing. If you want to turn to the back of our hymnal to number 591, this 
responsive reading is entitled God's Care. I'll read the fine print and you can respond together in the bold print. Number 591. Taken from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a to the Lord. The home shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are over their heart, and save as such as he hath of the Lord spirit. God bless the reading of his word. I love that one verse. This could apply to men or women. It said, this poor man cried. This more poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. That could be any one of us, couldn't it? God saves us out of all our troubles. All right, we're going to sing one more song together. This one is a patriotic song. I know we've gone past the 4th of July, but we are... Uh, Hopefully people that not only love the Lord, but love our country as well. So let's sing this song, America the Beautiful, number 505. Oh. 
Thank you for that good singing. Uh, normally we would have a special number this morning, but uh, Gordy's name is in the bulletin not because he has a special number, but because he is sick. Um, so we want to pray for Gordy. If you look at our uh, prayer requests there, you'll, there are several names there. We want to pray for uh, Peter and Lily Campersall too. Uh, Lily called and said that they have COVID in their household. Uh, my friend Dan Reisner gave me two names, Clayton Riggs and Jerry uh, Cassandra, to pray for. We want to pray for them as well. We prayed last week for Howard and Helen Riley as well, and we want to lift them up. Any update on that, Sharon? Helen's at home, but she's still much better. Okay. All right. So she's come home from the hospital. Okay. All right. Um, Sue, you want to just mention what you said to me earlier about your sister? All right, let's pray for Sue's sister, Dottie. All right, any other, uh, any other prayer requests this morning? Our dear Shelley uh, had a, a test, and uh, the results came back that, uh, is it okay to say this? What? Is it okay for me to tell them this? Okay. Um, uh, she, they found cancer again in her lung. So this is number six now, the sixth time you've been fighting it. So let's pray especially for Shelly today. Tony had COVID too? Yeah. All right, let's pray for Tony. Anyone else today? All right, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's spend a few moments in silent prayer. If you want to lift a prayer request to the Lord, and then I'll lead us in a corporate prayer momentarily. Let's turn to him. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus, that great and glorious name, the name that is above every name. And you invite us to come, call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And Lord, we come before you knowing that you are a God who hears our prayer and answers our prayer. And we look to you, God. We know that oftentimes uh, we are people that turn to many other things and worry about many things. But Lord, you tell us not to worry about anything, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let our requests be made known unto God. And so Lord, we come with thanksgiving in our heart, but we bring our supplications to you. And we, we look to the promise that you give there in Philippians that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, today we would bring these requests. We come before you asking that you work in the situation in the Middle East, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray for our country today as we are in need of reformation and revival. Lord, so, certainly we, uh, in the midst of all that's going on, uh, we pray, Lord God, that this may be a time when we return to you. We just celebrated our 248th anniversary or birthday and Lord, we are in need of you more than at any other time in our country. Lord, we would pray today for those who are sick. I, I pray for Gordy Allen today, who is at home. We pray that you would touch him and heal him. We pray for Peter and Lily Campersall, who are fighting COVID. We, we pray for Tony, um, John's brother, who also has COVID. Lord, for the situation with Susan's sister, Dottie, who has this heart condition. We pray, Lord God, that you administer to her heart and life. And I pray that you administer to Sue's heart today as she uh, struggles with hearing about her sister's condition. For these friends of Dan's, for Clayton Riggs with prostate cancer surgery awaiting, and for Jerry Cassandra who struggles with dementia, we pray for them. We thank you, Lord, for the good news about Helen Riley. We pray continue touch on her life and for Howard as well with what he faces. Lord God, I would pray for these other requests that we've brought in other weeks for uh, Irso, or Irso Alley, Lord, uh, who is recovering from a stroke. 
for John, Lord, who has his own health issues, for, for his son, John, that he would come to the Lord, for Jim Grimm, who is, who's hospitalized, for the Hartmans, thank you that Dawn is here today. Continue to touch her and bless Bob, touch his life as well. Thank you, Lord, that Darlene is here, and we pray that her back would continue to be strong and healthy, that the surgery would be uh, successful in keeping her back uh, in order, and we pray for her as she continues to uh, wean off of the shingles medications as well. For Dolly Hedrick, we pray for her today. For Sherry, who, who's dealing with uh, this arthritis, God, rheumatoid arthritis, we pray, Lord, that you would touch her and strengthen her. For Trisha's son, Justin, we pray for him as he responds to re rehabilitation. For baby Jacob, for Bob Kanake today, Lord, we ask for him as he continues to struggle with circulation issues. For Shirley Lintz and for Leland, we pray for them. For Elaine Longjohn, Lord, as she continues to recover from her stroke. For Dolly Love, Lord, we thank you that Dolores is here today and we pray your continued healing for her as she uh, recovers from her broken femur and seeks to gain full use of her legs and be able to be mobile again. For Shelly today, Lord, you know the news she heard on Monday and how discouraging that may be. But Lord, I pray that you would give her grace. I pray that you would give her healing. I pray, Lord God, that you'd give her encouragement and courage in the midst of what she faces. For Solomon Miller today, who is going through rehab, touch him. For Natalie, Karen's relative, for both Karen and Gary as they deal with their own health issues. For Pastor Phillips, we thank you for him. Continue to touch him and strengthen him. For Dan Reisner today, with his eyesight, we pray, Lord God, that you would continue to tweak that so that he can see well in that one eye. Strengthen him today. For Jimmy Rose, Shirley's brother. For Richard Scarborough, who has going to have this re fluid removed again from his lungs. For Frank Tapti... Uh, Stepiziano, we pray, Lord God, as he has gone through this heart surgery, you would touch him. For Elaine Tinsley, we pray for her. For Marilyn, who lost her husband this spring, we pray that you administer your grace and comfort. For Stella and Dennis, we pray your blessing upon her as she cares for him. I pray, Lord God, that you would give him uh, insight. I pray that you'd bless their union, and I pray, Lord God, that you would just touch them with the, your sense and your presence in their lives. For my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Woody and Lisa, for the heart issues, or rather the, the cancer issues he's facing, and for her ankle to recover, we pray, Lord God, that you would touch them. And finally, Lord, we bring before you all those who, who have been persecuted for their faith. Lord, I pray that in the midst of what they face, uh, whether it's simply persecution or the ultimate Lord of giving their life for Jesus, I pray that you would, you would minister to those families, that you would give them boldness in speaking the word of God and courage as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time where we can pray to you. And we lift all these requests in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing our prayer response. Thank you for praying, and I hope you bring your bulletins home with you and use those as a prayer reminder throughout the week. All right, we're going to take our offering at this time. So I'm going to call on John to take the offering. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give, and we pray, Lord God, that as we give, that this might be an offering that is an aroma that's sweet-smelling in your nostrils. Help us to give it with cheerful hearts, because, Lord, you love a hilarious giver. Thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's sing our doxology together, can we?
If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me. Uh, on the back side of the bulletin is my outline. Uh, I have as the text Judges chapter 2, but I'm going to read before that in the last chapter of Joshua, a few pages back. So we're going to read the last section of Joshua chapter 24. If you were with us last week, we read the story about Joshua just before he was going to die, that he stood before the whole nation of Israel, remember? And he said to them, if you recall, choose for yourselves today whom you're going to serve. And then he said this famous statement, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so that's the, that's the last word, in essence, the last word in Testament of Joshua. And now the writer obviously has to be someone else besides Joshua because it tells us now that Joshua is going to die. So let's read uh, Joshua 24, beginning with verse 29, and then we'll go to Judges 2 because it's kind of a repeat of the same thing. All right, here's what it says. Joshua 24, 29. After these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at timnath Sirah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. As for the, the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the, in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of uh, uh, Phinehas, his son which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for your word. I pray that you would sanctify us in your truth, for your word is truth. Help us, Lord, to see um, as you speak to us about generations that we may once again turn our hearts to the living God. Bless this time together now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a story told of, uh, of a head pastor of a church who woke up early on a Sunday morning and it was so beautiful outside, he decided he need to go golf, needed to go golfing that day. And so he called in sick and then he heads out to the golf course and he starts golfing. Meanwhile, the angels in heaven are kind of upset with this preacher that's playing golf on Sunday. Do you see that God? The angels said to God. What are you going to do? Are you going to let him get away with this? And so the man gets on the first tee, and God gives the pastor a nice burst of wind as he hits his first ball at the start of a difficult course, and the ball sails all the way into the green and rolls straight into the hole. Hole in one. The angel said, what are you doing, God? Seriously? Why are you doing that, God? And God says to them, Who's he going to tell? <laughs> All right. Last week, we talked at the beginning of my message about generations. Now, I'm talking about generations as we delineate them in the United States of America. And if you weren't here last week, I'm just going to give a quick review. And that was, I think most of us fit, except the young people like Caden and my children here, uh, most of us fit into one of two categories. Here are the categories. The silent generation was, were people born from 1928 to 1945. Now, I'm not asking if you fit there, but some of you I know fit there. That's the silent generation. They lived in the Second World War. And they were known for their resilience and commitment to social stability. Then, the next generation, the ones that were born from 1946 to 1964, are called what? Remember, remember what they're called? Baby boomers. Baby boomers. I'm one of them. That is, all the men and women that came back from the Army or from the Second World War said, hey, let's have children. And they did for the next 18 years. And so a good portion of us also fit in that category. So we're either part of the silent generation or part of the baby boomers. 
And then uh, I think I figured out that this is, you said 2012 you were born? Okay, so you and Abigail and Stephen and Emmeline all fit in Generation Z, right? I have millennials in my, I mean, in my, of my children, but those are Generation Z. All right, so I asked the question at the beginning of my message, into what generation were you born? And you can answer that one, right? Into what generation were you born? So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk scripturally about the generations around the book of Exodus and around the book of Joshua and then in the book of Judges. If you remember, and if you want to follow the outline, I would call this Generation A. The Generation A is led by Moses. You remember Moses? Uh, if you read the book of Genesis, the book of, in the book of Genesis, it's, it's Jacob dying and it's Joseph in Egypt. And then you get to the book of Exodus, it's just 430 years later. And the Bible says there arose a Pharaoh who did not know who Joseph was. Like Joseph, this famous person that saved all these people from famine. And they forgot about it. And the children of Israel aren't the, you know, they're not the most uh, uh, glorious, they weren't the most favored nation status anymore. They were the most famous slavery status. They were slaves in Egypt. And they cried out to God. And what did God do? God raised up a leader. He raised up a deliverer. His name was Moses. And Moses came to Pharaoh after going into the, you know, going away for 40 years. He comes back and he tells Pharaoh, let my, God says, let my people go. Remember what Pharaoh said? No. And so then God has to send the 10 plagues. And finally, the last plague is the plague of the death of the firstborn and God delivering all the children of Israel from that death plague. And we call that Passover. And so that generation, led by Moses, witnessed the miracles of God. The Lord had ten miracles that he did in Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh, after his firstborn was killed, he said, okay, I'll let them go. But even after that, if you remember, he let him go. And as soon as he had let him go, almost, almost as soon as they were out the door, in essence, he goes, what was I thinking? And so he sends his army along with himself. He sends them in his chariots after the children of Israel. And they come to a place where they're trapped. You remember that story? And there's no place for them to go. And so the children of Israel cry out, hey, what did you bring us out in the wilderness here so we could die out here? And God does one more miracle for the children of Israel and that he parts the Red Sea and they walk through as on dry land. And then when Pharaoh and his army follow in, God causes the sea to go back and they're all drowned in the Red Sea. You know that story, right? That was the first generation those people who saw God at work literally doing miraculous things for his people. And then when they get into the, you know, when they get into the wilderness and they don't have water, they complain about water, then God miraculously gives them water numerous times. And they don't have food, and so God gives them manna every day, six days a week. This miraculous God. And yet when, when God sends or has Moses send in the 12 spies and the, and the report comes back, they say, we're not going to go in. And so they wander for 40 years and die in the wilderness. But what I said was this, that they witnessed the Lord's miracle and they were delivered from bondage in Egypt. That was their life. They knew God, at least. And then we get to the next generation. If you, and we didn't read the book of Deuteronomy, but great book to read. Basically, it's a, a bunch of long sermons. If you like long sermons. It's a bunch of long sermons by Moses. Listen to what Moses said. I forgot I was going to read this. There's not enough room in this, on this pulpit here, sorry, for all the stuff I've got here. Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, listen to what Moses says during one of his long sermons. He says, 
And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all the good things you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery." Beware when you have plenty to eat and you have these great places that God gives you even when, though you didn't actually build them. Be careful you don't forget God. And he says it again in chapter 8. All right, so that's the next generation. The next generation hears all these sermons. It's basically um, uh, Moses telling them, you're in the generation, you're going to go into the land. And so the next generation, number two in my outline, is Generation B. And that is a generation led by Joshua. All the generation of older people, 20 years and older, had died. And now it's a new generation growing up. And what did they do? They were the ones who stood kind of like the same way their parents had did. They stood on the east side of the Jordan. And I'm sure they wondered, how are we going to cross the Jordan? In fact, the Bible says when they were going to cross, it was during flood season. So imagine trying to cross a river that's flooding. And you know what God did? God caused, they took the Ark of the Covenant and, and the, the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant. When they, their feet touched the water, the water stopped up down the, down the river. The, in fact, the place was called Adam. The, the water stopped. And now here's the river not a flowing, a flooded river. Now it's a riverbed that's empty and they can walk through. Kind of sounds like a similar story from a previous generation, doesn't it? So they go through and they cross into the promised land. And they go in and they, they, they go against this giant fortified city with huge walls. The name of the city was Jericho. And we said it last week, remember Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And numerous times throughout that, throughout that conquest, the children of Israel went into the land and they conquered. The only time they lost was when they were foolish enough to go into Ai and not ask God about it beforehand. God delivered them. So in the, in the second generation, generation B, led by Joshua, witnessed the Lord's power. Now, God's power was at work in Egypt, but this specifically is God's power to overthrow the enemies. They went in and took all the land, and they conquered the promised land. This land that God promised them, they had to overtake the people in it. And they did. And that's what Joshua did. So now, if you want to turn with me to Judges chapter 2, I'm going to reference chapter 1. They it's kind of a review of what happened. They conquest the land. But you know what happens is they go, and there's some places where they don't actually get rid of all the other people. And the people become a burden to them. They become a snare to them. They don't get rid of all of their enemies. And so God is kind of angry with them. He's going to, but he's going, to be, he's going to be careful to continue to follow and keep his covenant. So now here's, I'm going to read chapter 2, verses, starting with verse 6. This is in Judges 2, verse 6. It's kind of a, re, uh, a review of what was said at the end of chapter 24. Then Joshua dismissed the people. The people of Israel went to his, to his uh, the people of Israel went to each to his inheritance to take possession of the land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of a hundred ten years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance of Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountains of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. All right. So if we go back to Joshua chapter 24, it says that Joshua died. 
at 110 years old. They buried him in his place. I was reading an article about in 2022, they kind of figured out where Joshua's particular land was and where he was buried, and they were going to do some excavations. I'd love to see how they found it. This beautiful spot, kind of like on a hill, maybe overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. It was a beautiful spot that the children of Israel had given to Joshua. But Joshua died. I'm not sure if you caught it. Uh, they did something else that was in obedience to God. If you remember back in the end of the book of Genesis, jo uh, Joseph said, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. Take my bones to the promised land. And so for 500 years, they took care of his bones and they buried him in Shechem. 500 years later. But what happened here? <clears throat> This is, in essence, the end of Generation B. These are the people led by Joshua who died as well as Joshua. Joshua, having died, and all the generation died with him. And they knew the Lord. They'd seen what God had done. The children of Israel during Moses' time had seen the ten plagues. The children of Joshua's time had seen all of God's power being at work as they took the promised land. And now what happens? Well, let's go back to the text. I stopped at verse 10 on purpose. It said, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. So the second generation, generation B in my outline, are all dead, aren't they? Now look what the writer says here. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. Let me read it again. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. Isn't that a sad commentary? That's a horrible commentary. That here are people that have seen God literally at work. They've seen the miraculous work of God on their behalf. They have witnessed God's power and God's deliverance. They are no longer slaves in Egypt. They are now possessors of the promised land, promised centuries before to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. All the things that God had said he would do had come to fruition. And now here's a new generation growing up. And what does the writer say about them? They don't know the Lord. They do not know the Lord. Now, I've contemplated this week, and I could say, okay, let's figure out why they don't know the Lord. <laughs> Was it because their parents didn't say anything? Was it because they were blind to all the things that God did? We could come up with all kinds of reasons why they don't know the Lord. Ironically, <clears throat> excuse me, the text of Scripture doesn't tell us why. I would think that too. But the Bible doesn't say. What we do know is this. Is the warning of Moses that I read in Deuteronomy. When everything goes well for you, be careful that you don't forget the Lord. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord. Now let's go on. I want to read how this happened and how it worked out in this book. So I'm reading verse 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding uh, enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them and they were in terrible distress." So here's what happens. I'm not going to read this text, but here's what, here was, here's what happens. If you read the book of Judges, the book of Judges can be descri described as a book of cycles. And here's how it would work. 
The children, I'm going to walk over here. Hopefully you can steal them really Larry. Um, the children of Israel would do evil in the sight of the Lord, and God would send somebody who would plunder them, whether it was the Canaanites, whether it was the Philistines, whoever it was, and they would plunder them. And when they got in trouble, you know what they would do? Help us, God! Now that's a small prayer, but basically they prayed to God. God, help us! You know what God would do? He'd help them. Like God has always done. He would send, the Bible says he sent judges, different judges that would come, and he would, that judge would deliver them from their enemies. And so they'd be delivered from the hand of their enemies. And then life would go pretty good for them. And you know what would happen? They were right back to what they were doing before. They'd forget God. You know what I've come to conclude? I'm not conclude, but kind of surmise that when I think about my Christian life and the life of many of my friends around, our life is more like judges than it is anything else. That when we get in trouble, we come to God and we cry out to God and God helps us and then Things get okay, and we kind of go, well, hey, I can handle this on my own now, God. Everything's fine and dandy. And then things start turning sour again. You know what I'm saying? God brought judges, even in the midst of their disobedience. Another theme of the book of Judges is this. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Even when mankind... God's people were doing their own thing, yet God was great or merciful enough with them that when they called out to him in distress, God answered their prayers and brought a judge. I wanted to say one other thing about these gods. You remember, the, did you notice the names of these gods that they, that they worshipped? There are two names. One is the name Baal. Baal. In the New Testament, there's a god called Beelzebub. You know who that is? That's Satan. So these gods, although they're you know, worshipped by people, they're really, all behind them is the evil one, Satan himself. And Baal, the god Baal was attractive as a rival to Yahweh because he was thought to be the God over the weather and the nature for the Canaanites. So if they wanted good crops, they wanted fertile lands, then they would offer sacrifices to this God. And oftentimes the sacrifices were gory, even child sacrifice. But they thought he was the one, this Baal was the one that would give them Fertility, not only fertility in their lands, but then fertility in, in, their, in their families. In essence, the bottom line was this God gave them the personal wealth that they wanted to have. The other God mentioned here is the Ashtara, the Ashtara or Ashtoreths, and this God was like an attractive rival also because it was a female god and she was seen more as the god of love and sex and fertility. And so the bottom line basically might say is that this god, Ashtoreth, was the one that gave sex and love to the people. Even in their ritualistic uh, Worship, they would have like temple prostitutes there. I mean, it was horrible. But if we were to look even today and bring ourselves into the 21st century, we would say, well, we would never worship Baal, would we? We would never worship the Ashtoreths, would we? I mean, we're not interested in money, are we? We're not interested in fame and Sex, are we? Now, I'm being a tad bit facetious here, aren't I? Because the gods that they worshipped oftentimes are the same gods that we worship. We just aren't sophisticated enough to call them, or maybe we're more sophisticated not to call them by a real name. Well, what am I saying here today, my friends? 
I'm telling the story and my message was called, you know, Generational Concerns, part two, because in part one, Joshua made a comment that he and his family were going to serve the Lord. He and his household would serve the Lord. And now we get to the next generation and we wonder, how did they not know the Lord? I believe that God calls us as his people to himself, that he reminds us of his goodness, and we look once again at all that Jesus Christ did for us in dying on the cross. In essence, the whole message of the cross is this. God recognized that we were people who had a tendency to go our own way. Isaiah said it this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us is turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so our call, my friends, is to recognize that it is so easy for us to forget the Lord. And we need to recognize him in every day of our life. If you want to read with me the conclusion there. The conclusion says, read this out loud with me, would you? God gives us a history of generations in the nation of Israel. As you consider your own life, to which generation do you belong? There's generation A, led by Moses and seeing the miraculous things of God. There's generation B, who's Joshua, who, was, who led the conquest of the uh, promised land. And then there's that third generation, another generation, who did not know the Lord. My friends, to which generation do you belong? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that... You gave us a history of the children of Israel, and yet, Lord, you have always been faithful. Even in their unfaithfulness, you sent judges to deliver them. Lord, I thank you, God, that in our life that we can know a God who is faithful and will fulfill his promise to us. And we pray, Lord God, that we may once again commit ourselves to being your people. That like Joshua said, at the end of his life. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Strengthen us, God, by your spirit to walk with you in the obedience of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn from here to um, the communion portion of our service. And uh, it's in the bulletin it says moments of self-examination I think we've sung that song at the beginning of the service search me O God so let's just spend a few moments before the Lord asking God to search our hearts can we let's pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's recite together the, the faith that we have as is expressed in the Apostles' Creed. If you're uncertain, it's number 513 in the hymnal, but I think many of us know it by heart. Let's recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, when he had supped, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this, covenant, this, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Paul says, for as often as you drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for you. Let's have a moment of silent prayer before the Lord. Is there anyone that would like to lift up a prayer of thanksgiving to God at this time? Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, Strengthen you in true faith unto everlasting life. Amen. Anyone with a testimony this morning you'd like to give? I think well, we've all been in all those generations. You've been sometimes, in all those generations? Yeah, sometimes we go back and forth and <laughs> things get too good and we forget where all our blessings come from. Uh, that sounds like our country going through right now. It's an amazing that human nature hasn't changed at all in the 6,000 years of human life, right? I would like to say something. Yes, Jan. I think really God is, there are the people that say they don't believe in God. But when they need him, yeah. like you say, they pray for him. So how can you say you don't believe in God when you will all of a sudden need him for something and then you pray for him? I don't understand that. I have a brother like that. I think they believe in God. I think he does too. But he, they are rebuking him. He, he, I think it's because of different things that have happened in their life. That how could God allow that to happen? And that's why they don't believe in God? Or like uh, things that are happening right now. How could God allow all these children and women? And, and to me, you have the children, okay? But what good is a child? <clears throat> Without a mother or father. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not right. So what's happening right now, a lot of people are doubting God, I believe. Because God should not allow these things to happen. And I say, it's not God that's allowing. 
you know, it's there is a lot of a lot of uh, cruelty human to human. Yes. And not so much God. But right. it's man's inhumanity to man. There will always be war. There will okay. always be. He it, said so. And the thing is, like in the Bible, it says about one disease that one would be able to find a cure for. I really, truly believe that disease is hate. I believe hate is a disease. Okay? Uh, people would say it was cancer, but there's a lot of different cures for different types of cancer. So it's not that. My children, when my children grow up, my children are never ever allowed to say the word hate because you can't hate a person. Because if you hate a person, you don't care what happens to that person. So I never allowed that word in my home. If my kids didn't allow their kids to say that, you know what I mean? And you know, well, we recognize in the scriptures is that God uh, loves the righteous, and it's not that he hates the wicked, but he hates the things that the wicked do, right? Uh, you know, uh, God says, I hate divorce, that's things people do. You know, I hate those that speak lies. And so it's God hatred, God's hatred is toward the acts of men that are evil, right? And evil really... When we think of evil, again, this is a little philosophical here, but evil is really the absence of God, isn't it? Men do evil because they have rejected God. And so God was not the originator of evil, but evil comes from man's heart turning away from God. And so when that happens, we recognize it's not God's fault that that happens. It's mankind's fault. I and Well, I would say this in regards to uh, our nature, you know, when David gives his testimony in Psalm 51, he said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me, that we unfortunately have an old nature, right? Now think of it, if you had children, did you ever have to teach your children how to do well? I mean, how to do bad? Did you have to teach your children how to, you know, and fight? What? They just watched you? <laughs> I mean, when, when, they, when they grow up, you have to teach them to behave, don't you? Because the natural tendency is for them to do wrong, right? I mean, I have a cat. We have a cat in our house. Do you have to teach the cat to do wrong? He does it automatically. I'm not saying the cat has an old nature. I'm just saying it's an illustration. Uh, humanity, we have an old nature. But by God's grace, God can give us strength to do what is right, right? Honestly, uh, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith in God is a gift that he gives us, right? And the very next verse the writer says, Paul says, uh, for you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. So it's God who is at work in us even to do the good things that we do. So let's walk in the grace of God and in the strength that he gives to be people of God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Jen. Anyone else? Stand and receive the benediction and we will sing the doxology or the, our closing praise. Now may the God of peace who brought up again the, our great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for coming today. God bless you.